All right, let's take a look at how we're going to master a concert using Pyramix. Uh, the concert we're using is the October 20th, 2012 Peabody Symphony Orchestra concert during which Lawrence Manchester received the Alumnus of the Year Award. I've already taken the master discs and uh, c copied the audio data onto the drive in these two folders. So we have disc one here uh, that shows the uh, uh, each of the audio tracks uh, on the disk. Uh, these extra files show up once I've imported it into um, Pyramix. Uh, so if, if your project hasn't yet been imported into Pyramix, you'll, you won't see those additional files. Uh, disk 2, as you can see, these were not yet loaded into Pyramix. So we've got 1 through 5 there still existing without the uh, additional files. So what I need to do now is go into Pyramix so we can start working on this. I've already got Pyramix open in the background so it opens very quickly. And we're going to go under project and create a new project. So 44.1. Uh, in this case we're working with a project that's just 16-bit. It's coming off a CD so there's really not much advantage in this case to going to 24-bit. That's really uh, uh, more advantageous when you're working with a microphone based source or transferring from analog. Going to next here, project workspace. Uh, we're going to use the, our typical formatting here and we're going to call this PSO concert. I'm going to put LM so you know it was Lawrence Manchester and I'm going to have you put your name in parentheses so I know whose project is whose. There my phone's ringing in the background but uh, that's okay. Uh, scrolling down the list here I'm going to look for the drive that contains the audio files is right here and I'm looking for the concert files right there and that's where I'm going to store this project. I click next one more time and here I can pick what kind of mixer I want to use which is just kind of a quick way to get up and running. Uh, we do have a CD mastering setup, very basic two channels going to a stereo summing bus. I think that's going to be fine for what we're doing right now. So I'm going to hit finish and that's going to create this basic session for us to start with. Here we go. All right, so we've got this real simple mixer. In fact, this one contains two stereo tracks, uh, stereo channels, which should be fine for what we're doing. Let's take a look over here. Um, this is uh, there's a variety of ways of doing this. Um, th this is a reasonable setup right now where we have two stereo tracks. We actually want to have uh, either a total of four mono tracks or two stereo tracks to do the kind of editing that I'm going to show you. We're going to do something that's called source destination editing. You can see it right here under the edit list. And there's a bunch of options under here that will become more familiar as we get into this type of editing. And what we're going to do is come down here under track groups and we're going to create a couple different track groups. One that's called source and the other that's called destination. And those names are just names for us to conveniently uh, identify with uh, to, to actually have the functionality of uh, those types of tracks we need to select that under type. So they're not free tracks, they're a source track and a destination track. The other feature that we want to in, uh, incorporate is this auto mute, and you'll see why that's important shortly here. And by the way, if we're not really using the mixer uh, and we're working with a computer with just one screen right here, we can get it out of our way and um, uh, give us more uh, access to our editor window just by clicking this button up here. We can always bring it up later if we need to mix something. So let's go under tracks now, and we can see that. Even though they're showing up as stereo, we do have inputs one on these two guys and inputs two on these two guys. We're just going to incorporate these into the group, um, source destination groups that we've already created. Um, you can do this kind of however you want, but I'm going to make the top two both destination here and the bottom two both source. You can flip those around, but uh, this is a fairly logical way of doing it, so I'm going to keep it like this for now. All right. Now, one thing you're already noticing here is as I click in a particular group, so when I'm in the destination group, you'll notice that the source mutes and vice versa. When I click down here in the source, the destination tracks will mute. That's kind of the key to this type of editing. You can do this kind of editing in something like Pro Tools or Logic, um, but it's a little bit cumbersome in that you don't have that auto mute feature. So it means you're manually having to mute something that you don't want to listen to. This is, uh, this is a lot more efficient way to work. 
I come over next to the media management. We need to find the folder uh, in which these audio files are stored. So here is the the folder on that drive that has the audio files and I need to come up here and I can either click under the media folder mount media folder or I can click this icon right here which does the same thing and I can browse here say under my SM drive I'm going to scroll down here's PSO concert click OK hit mount and this should scan and find and it did our two disks disk 1 and disk 2 so what I'm going to do to start off with here is grab disk 1 and I'm going to pick uh, my source track as the location where I want these to end up. I'm just going to click over here and do control A which is going to select all of the files and then right click with the mouse and select place. Now there's a whole bunch of different options here and depending on what you're doing uh, you're probably going to find at some point you're going to use every one of these or certainly most of them. Right now we're going to use just the default which is append to cursor sorted by name on selected track. Let's click OK and see what happens. Now we're zoomed way 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 out here. Uh, 24 hours of time here. Um, zero, there's 20 hours and so forth so it's really zoomed in pretty far. If I just click down here to deselect I can hit option one and that's going to zoom in to just the audio that's currently present in the track. Um, holding down option and scrolling the wheel on my mouse will allow me to uh, zoom in and out on that. Uh, I'm going to click over here now and choose location where I want to have the disk 2 contents placed. So I'm going to come over here and click the first audio track. I did control A to select them all. Right click to place. Append to cursor, the default option. Click OK and there is uh, disk 2 right now. Uh, available to us. There comes the waveforms. I was worried about that for a moment. Uh, those extra tracks that we saw on the desktop in the folder, uh, that has to do with this waveform data. So that's why we didn't see it immediately. It's going through here and rendering that information. So here's what we need to do now. We need to start listening to the audio files. Oops, pardon me. Let me just close out of that. Uh, we need to listen to the audio that we have here and start assembling, uh, start assembling the audio. Alright, so let's find the beginning of the audio here. I'm not sure if you're going to be able to hear this on the video recording very well or not. Um, let's close this down below since we're not going to need it right now. And zoom up on this a little bit. Okay, so you may be hearing that through the microphone coming through the computer speakers. This is the beginning of this first work and this is the starting point where we're going to grab the audio. So what I'm doing here is when I move the cursor around, I'm hitting the open bracket symbol, which is the one that's um, right above the return key. You've got an open bracket and a closed bracket. So I'm using the open bracket to select this portion here. And I'm going to zoom out and find, in this case, it's just a one movement piece. So I'm going to find where the piece ends, it's still going. Here's a quiet section. And here's the applause. So we're going to need some of that, not all of it. So I'm going to grab some of that for now and hit the close bracket, which is directly above the return key on a Mac keyboard uh, or above the enter key on a Windows keyboard. And the exact location of this and the destination doesn't matter a heck of a lot. Uh, but I'm going to just pick here around zero and hit my open bracket symbol. And what you'll notice is that it creates the open bracket location, but it also, and this is actually a really cool feature, uh, shows you the location of where the end is going to be of the selected region. Now, by default, there is not a uh, keystroke for this function. We're going to do insert source to destination. Most of the systems um, at Peabody at one time or another had F1 set up as that uh, as that keyboard shortcut. So you can try hitting the F1 key. If it doesn't work you just have to go under source destination here and select it manually and you can go under the keyboard shortcut editor find that under your source uh, destination editing here which is uh, I believe under the edit menu here somewhere here we go, insert source to destination, and you can just teach it what, uh, what you want to use for that function. 
So I'm going to close out for now. I'm going to hit F1, and you'll see that all that audio now has been pushed up to the destination. The beauty here is that even if they're not, uh, if we go up here to play the top part, it's playing there, and if we click down to the bottom part, it's going to play down here. So we're always going to have our raw data to access while we're putting together a finished version. This is really the idea of source destination editing. I'm going to zoom into the beginning here and see how this starts. And that looks pretty good. Okay, so we can zoom in here. I keep hitting the wrong key. And we could grab, we could just click on this audio clip is the term. We call it a region in Pro Tools, but in Pyramix it's called a clip. And we can adjust this fade in. It's probably something you're familiar with. And play it and that, that uh, background noise comes up. That's going to be fine for a lot of situations, but where we need to get a little bit more detailed, there's the edit fade window is going to be uh, much more useful. Let's take a look at this right now. I'm going to zoom this uh, out just a little bit. And this is showing us more detail on the shape of that fade-in rather than just the generic linear fade-in. This actually has an exponential fade going on right now. And we have um, a bunch of preset options. The one that I'm going to recommend for the beginnings and ends, in most cases this cosine is going to be the best sounding one. So we're going to grab that. And then again, you're, you're not going to hear this all that well right now, but uh, when you play with it yourself, you'll be able to. This is going to be auditioning the in, the edit in with the curve. And so that's going to play through this and then into the audio that comes after it. You do have the option of setting the pre-roll time, so in this case there's nothing before it, so that's not very meaningful, uh, and a post-roll time, which is how long it's going to play after that point. You can go in and change these to the uh, default settings that are available. Right now we're just doing stereo, so this is uh, uh, very easy to see. If you're doing, say, a big orchestral project or wind ensemble or, or something of that nature where you've got lots and lots of tracks, um, showing all the tracks is going to be very difficult, um, make it very difficult to see what you're doing. So you can choose to see one or two tracks and simplify that a bit more. So let's close out of this for right now. That all looks good. If you don't like what you did, you can hit this thumbs down, which basically is a, a cancel and, and close the editor. This is accept changes, and although it says close the editor, it doesn't always uh, work that way when you're in this kind of view. So I'm just going to send that back down to the bottom here by clicking that little thumbtack and zoom back out on this. And we need to find our applause. Here's where our applause starts. And we can look at the time and see that's at 11.18. Um, why don't we do about uh, 20 seconds or so. So that's going to bring us up to 38. So that's the point at which we want the new uh, piece to, to come in. So I'm going to move my gate over just by hitting the open bracket to bring it to that spot. Then I'm going to come down here. Now another thing that you might find useful is you notice when I zoom in and out, both the source and the destination is zooming with me. If I come down here under my track groups, one of the things I can do is free zoom both of these groups. And that means that as I'm zoomed in up here, I can zoom out on my source tracks and still be seeing the same thing up top. So here is where the next piece comes in. This is probably tuning. Yep, that's just noise. So I'm going to scroll over, and by the way, holding control and rolling your wheel is going to allow you to jump around side to side. This should be the beginning of the next piece, which is Strauss's Four Last Songs. So I'm going to zoom in on this. I'm going to find the spot, getting comfortable with your keystrokes here, which is Option Shift 1 and 2. We're going to zoom up and down, make it easier for me to see what I'm doing. Now in this case, I'm going to want to I'm going to want to grab a bit of sound beforehand. I'm going to do that right there. And I'm going to scroll out to the end of this piece. We've got some movements going here, and I believe this takes us all the way to the end of this disc, most likely. So I'm going to jump out here right for now and just grab all of this. It doesn't matter that these clips are separate. Pyramix is going to grab everything that's within these gates and put them together. Then when we get up to the destination, we'll, we'll cut, cut some of this excess stuff out a little bit. So I'm going to hit F1, 
and let's zoom out on this and see what we got. Here is the actual cut that we just performed right here. There's where the, audio, the uh, clapping, the applause goes away and then right into silence after that, which isn't exactly what we're looking for. So what we need to do is get the, our cursor in the same ballpark as this splice and then go back into our edit feed window or the feed editor as it's called here. I can grab the top edge of this window and drag it up to see more detail. Quite often the where it starts is too far zoomed in for this kind of work. It's better for real detailed editing. Once we've got this in the general ballpark, I'll show you just a couple things we can do here. If we need to change where this comes in on the the in audio, which is on the right side of our splice, we can just click and drag to move that around. And on the outside, we can click and drag. And by the way, everything on other tracks, if there's a multi-track project, everything before and after stays in sync with whatever you're doing here. What I really want to do, though, is I want to create a bigger crossfade. And I want to be able to hear the uh, the applause kind of fade out to um, to not digital black, but I want it to fade out to room ambience. So I, while that's fading out, I want the room ambience to kind of sneak in. Now this, this is the kind of thing that's going to be helpful to listen to on headphones because there's a lot of detail that will be missed even just listening through speakers in a studio. So fade out. Now that was way too fast. It sounds very artificial. Basically what I want you to accomplish here is I want you to make the fade out sound so realistic that it's like the audience really just faded out naturally like that and the audience came in. Now anybody that has been trained to listen to these sort of things isn't really going to be fooled by it. You're going to be able to notice but you'd be surprised if you can get this really smooth uh, most listeners aren't going to recognize that that's what's going on. Um, I'm going to change this to a cosine crossfade. Now I did, wouldn't do this for just a regular music edit, but I think it's going to work well in this transition here. Let me just see how this works. It's actually not too bad. We want to really make sure that we're not fading up the beginning of the next piece. Now one thing, when you're doing this kind of editing, what's quite often useful is to not have the length of these two linked together. So if I break the link, I can actually reduce... Oops, I want to undo that. Ah, I went too far, sorry. Uh, <laughs> let's rebuild this really quickly. So let me zoom back out. We're going to relink these, create that nice big long crossfade. I'm going to move this over to there. And what I want to do is not have the mirror or link. So what this means is that when I go to my fade in point, I'm just going to click OK on that for now. When I go to my fade in point, I can drag it over and have it now be independent of the fade out. So let me go to my fade out now. Because these are no longer linked or mirrored, I'm going to go under my out up, uh, and make that a cosine out, which I think is going to be most appropriate. And I think actually this uh, in preset is going to be uh, going to be appropriate here. This is giving me a, um, a basic exponential fade in, which I think is going to be most appropriate in this case. So we're going to leave it at that. And let's see what this sounds like. Good. I think that sounds pretty good. Now, in the case of uh, positioning this, if I, uh, we are still, our position is still linked. So as I move this, if I decide that I want a little less applause but I need a little bit more room ambience, I can slide this around. And if I find that the timing is right but I just want a little bit more time with the ambience afterwards, I can grab over here and move this around. So really powerful tools here. So I'm happy with all that. I'm going to click the thumbs up. I'm going to close out of that. And we can see that Obviously, this would have been nearly impossible, if not impossible, to come up with that kind of detail just working within the editor here. So we've got that real nice transition. And when it comes time to put the CD marks in, I can grab any location I want. It doesn't have to be right at the break. It could be any location, like say right here, where I want to drop that marker in.